delighted now to uh, welcome uh, Chris Whitty, who's very kindly come over from the Department of Health. And as you know, Chris is the Chief Scientific Advisor of the Department of Health and Social Care. He is also, um, so he is at the moment leading NIHR and can, will continue to lead that and is the Department's Research and Development Chief Advisor. Um, he will, uh, he was appointed in June 2019 and I think next week takes up his new duty as Chief Medical Officer for England and, and then the UK Government's Chief Medical Advisor. So he's got a week to go um, before he starts that job. So we're absolutely delighted that he's here today in a very busy schedule. And he's going to be talking particularly about influencing policy and practice in the area of prevention and how that feeds through to the kind of research that we should be doing. Chris, welcome. Thank you. So most of you sitting here are experts in this area. I'm going to make a few comments, most of which are obvious, a couple of which occasionally I think may not be as obvious to other people as they are to me working in government. And I've been a chief scientific advisor of one sort or another in government for 10 years. So the one thing I can say with confidence is how, how does evidence land in central government? I have a bit of an understanding about how it lands in the public health sy system. I'm a public health practitioner myself of an academic sort and a bit of understanding of it in local government. But national government is sort of my area of speciality. And I'm going to start off with just some general comments about how evidence works in central government and then work on to how I think that's relevant uh, to this call. The first thing to say is that um, the way in which most academics, I'm sure not all of you, but most academics think of evidence uh, into policy is they think the evidence will come out and then the policy will change. That is incorrect. <laughs> so what actually happens is that at certain moments in time, the window of opportunity for a particular area to change opens, often at very short notice, you don't get much warning about it, and then it closes again. Usually, you, the political time, that's usually a matter of th three to six months, is absolute tops. Now, there is clearly no chance at all of doing serious research in that window of time. But what you can do is get through in that window absolutely everything that we know up to that point in time. And then the window closes, and then you have to wait a bit, and then the cycle happens again. That's the way, in reality, it works. So it is very important when we're doing research that we actually basically accumulate evidence and accumulate and accumulate, and then we wait for our moment, and then we go for it. And we don't give up just because people have paid no attention for the last couple of years, because it's simply that the time isn't right. And then you just go very, very hard at the time when the time is right. So that's the first general point I wanted to make. And it's simply because I think there is a huge misapprehension about this uh, among uh, many of our colleagues who don't have to deal with policymakers. The second uh, thing um, is that uh, if you think about, I'm going to talk about two triangles here. The first of which is the iron triangle of project management. Anyone who does project management knows this, uh, that you've got to see and resource. Uh, if you have almost no time, and in government, between a minister wanting a policy and there being a policy, you have, there is usually weeks to months. If you try and produce evidence in that time, with the resource we've got, the quality will be very, very poor. Just there is not time enough to pull stuff together. So you've got to do it in advance. So a lot of what I do is try to spot trends in advance. If I'm good at it, I can usually spot them a year out. I can usually, I'm pretty good at getting them six months in advance. But I have to say, at this point in political time, uh, <laughs> uh, even though I consider I'm better than average, I'm certainly making a lot of things where I call it wrong, just because things go all, going all over the, over, over the shop. So that's just a reality. Uh, and I, I would be very doubtful any of you could predict where exactly ministers will be in six months. Maybe, maybe I may be wrong, but that would be my that would be my guess in terms of what they want. Um, so that's one triangle. But the other triangle, which I think is more important for the kind of research that we uh, commission in these kinds of calls, is a different triangle, and it's the one that I think about when I think of evidence. And uh, the three tri the three sides of this triangle. On one side, is how difficult or expensive is this? Is this politically difficult? Is it expensive to do? Will the public hate it? Then the second side of the triangle is how big an effect are we going to get if we do the thing that someone has recommended? And the third side of the triangle is how strong is the evidence? Those are the three sides of the triangle I'm always thinking of. Now, if something is dead easy to do, then actually the amount of evidence you need to back it up, if it's going to be largely cost-free and politically popular, is minimal. There's no point overdoing it. 
The fact is, that's like to go through relatively straightforwardly. If, on the other hand, this is a very unpopular policy, let us say we decide that we want to demonstrate whether there's evidence we should ban jammy dodgers, that is going to be deeply unpopular, <laughs> and that is only going to be possible if, A, we can demonstrate that will have a big impact on public health, and, B, the evidence is very strong. So we've got to think, in trying to work out what evidence do we need, how difficult is this going to be to push through? And if the answer is difficult, we're going to need a lot of evidence, and someone like me is going to have to then use all that evidence and fight quite a hard battle in government, saying the evidence here is overwhelming, and I'm completely convinced of that. The worst thing, from my point of view, is when public health colleagues ask me to try and defend a really unpopular movement for which there is almost no evidence. That is an indefensible position. Whereas, obviously, do something which is actually politically not difficult and cheap, uh, I don't really need very much uh, help to get that through. So that really, that is something I think it is worth bearing in mind when you're looking at uh, what people are putting forward uh, and uh, looking at the rigor of what they're doing. Then a couple of technical points on this. Um, uh, one is, uh, I would say, in general, our experience is that people wish to continue, continue to describe the problem in greater and greater detail for years after it is obvious what the problem is. And actually, now what we want to do is move on to, are there some solutions here? And actually describing yet with slightly narrower uh, confidence intervals how many people, for example, die of air pollution, to me is not very useful. It might be 20,000. It might be 50,000. Frankly, it's a lot of people. And what I really need to know is, what can we do to change it? So I think it is important to decide when we should shift from describing to changing. And my observation is we, as a community, academically, are far too late on that. And that was very much chimes with the last point that you made, which is you get a proposal which basically is restating, I would like to prove even more convincingly that the problem you think is a problem is a problem. Grand. <laughs> Not sure that's really going to be a terribly use of taxpayers' money or charity money uh, to uh, use it. So I think that would be my, my first technical point. My second technical point, and then I'll open to any kind of questions, having to go in any direction you want, within reason, um, uh, is um, to say that there is no policy problem I've had to deal with which can be answered with a single discipline. And most of them require multiple ones. If you think of any serious policy problem, it's going to require some quantitative data including probably some observational epidemiology or other kind of things. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm all for epidemiology, but that's not the answer. Even when you've got the trial, you're going to have to have some social science data, qualitative. You're going to have to have an economic analysis. Uh, you may well need stuff from educationists or physicists. or You may need data from a whole bunch of different areas before you can adequately answer the question. And realistically, relatively few institutions have got the best people in the UK in every discipline you're going to need. So it is actually, even if you're talking about big universities like Imperial College or Cambridge, actually you very often find you've got the, the best people in two areas, but actually people who are OK but not the best people in three others. And I think we should be a lot more imaginative. We're a small island. We should be a lot more imaginative at saying, honestly, actually the economists in Cambridge are not as good as the ones in York. Let's go and chat to, go on the train and chat to people in York. <laughs> I'm making, I'm, uh, to, to be clear, I'm, to be clear, I'm making this this up. But you know what I mean. I just didn't want to. I didn't. I, I wanted to pick on Cambridge rather than pick on you know the University of Droitwich, if there is such a thing. I, I think as a, as a kind of thing. But I would just sort of. I think we should just be really serious about trying to uh, work out how, how we do this because that's the way we're going to get the best answers is actually pulling together the best skills from different places, but that often will require looking slightly more widely than our mates down the pub, which is kind of how we, the way we tend to do it. And we all tend to know the people in our own institution and everyone in the country in our own discipline. But what we don't tend to know and we need help with is people elsewhere in the country in different disciplines. And that's the bit where I think people should be really pretty thoughtful.